Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's LRD webinar from the UDC Library on Personal Archiving. My name is Megan Kowalski, and I am the Outreach and Reference Librarian. This session is going to walk you through personal archiving, what it is, why you want to do it, and some best practices. Um, just to get started, feel free to leave any questions you have in the chat, and we will have time for questions both recorded and unrecorded at the end. So today's session, we're going to look at what is personal archiving, why and what you might want to archive, creating your own archiving, some best practices, what to do with that archive once you have it, and then we're also going to dip in a little bit to look at my personal archive to give you an example of what you can do with your material. So first things first, what is personal archiving? At the very basic level, it is the selecting, maintaining, and preserving of a record of objects from your personal experiences in life to keep for the future. And what that means is up to you. You get to define what is a part of your archive and what is worth saving. So why should you have a personal archive? First of all, it's the story of you. This is your life. It is something worth cherishing and saving. Next, it can also be the story of your family and your friends and your community. Again, whatever you decide to tell, that is your archive. And if you don't save it, it might not get saved at all. And you could do awesome things. And maybe these objects could end up in a museum one day. In fact, I just finished reading a book by Lonnie Bunch, who's now the director of the Smithsonian. But he was the one who got the National Museum of African American History and Culture off the ground. And he was talking about how some personal objects from individuals in this country were later added to the museum because they had been saved in a personal archive and now they're in a Smithsonian institution. So those are some things to consider. Yes, preserve it for yourself, but you never know where these objects might go. So what goes into a personal archive? As I've said many times, you get to decide, and it can be print items, it can be digital items, it can be 3D, 3D objects. Whatever you want to put in an, into your archive is fair game. It can include things like photos, both physical and digital photos. It can include documents, you know, personal stuff like diaries, or it could be life maintenance things like the deed to a condo. Whatever you consider a document worth saving can be in your archive. It can also be things like your emails, your tweets, your Instagram activity, or anything else that you do online. It could be diaries and journals. It could be objects or memorabilia like trophies, ribbons, holiday cards, mementos, jewelry, anything like that. It can also be oral and video history, either ones you complete or ones someone does of you. These are all things you can include in your archive. And what could go in there? Again, it's up to you. This list is not exhaustive. If you think it's worth saving, go ahead and save it. So now we're going to look at creating your personal archive. And I want to say that there is a lot of steps here. So Break it up. Take your time with it. Don't get overwhelmed. Um, if you want to take notes, feel free. I can also share these slides. And as I said, this session is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube, so you can visit it as often as you want. So step one, where is your stuff? Like, where is all of it? The physical stuff. Is it in boxes? Is it in bags? Is it in files? Is it in folders? Is it in closets? Is it in your attic? Is it in your basement? Wherever it is, where is your stuff? Same goes for the digital. Is it on your computers, your phone, hard drives, cameras, thumb drives, cloud services, social media? You know, are you a big gamer? Do you want to save your gaming history? Think of where all your stuff is and write it down. And then what you want to do next is gather it all up. And this takes time. So batch it up. The more stuff you have to consider, the longer this is going to take. So you don't need to sit down and try to do it in one big rush. Take your time with it, batch it up, and gather all the things you want to review. Next, you want to select. And that means reviewing every single item that you want to consider for your personal archive. 
And the reason this is important is that we just cannot save everything. Not even librarians and archivists save everything. We are going through the collections we receive and making decisions about what to keep and what to save. And so you need to do the same thing as well. And there are four main options you have here when you're reviewing your material. So the first thing is to trash outright. You know, things like, did you need that print receipt? Do you need that movie stub? Do you need that email? Go ahead and throw it away, recycle it, or delete it if you don't think it's worth saving. You can also digitize an item and then throw it away. There are some things we need to keep. There are certain documents you have to save for seven years. You know, your tax returns, those have to go in your archive for at least seven years. After that, you can trash them or you can keep a digital copy and then trash them. You can also digitize and then decide to keep an item. I happen to be a bullet journaler, so I like to digitize my bullet journal at the end of every year and then save the print copy. Again, this is up to you. And then there are some items you don't need to digitize or you can't digitize and you can just keep them. And I'll discuss how you can keep some of these items safely. Next, you want to sort and organize. And how you decide to do this is highly personal. It needs to make sense to you, but it also needs to make sense to someone who's going to come after you to either maintain, keep, or share this archive. So one of the most common ways to sort stuff is by date. So simply saying, I'm going to organize all of my photos in a box by date. That's one of the most common ways of sorting material. Then you can also sort by type, you know, keep all your photos in one spot, all your documents in one spot, and then by date, you know, you can have multiple levels of organization. You can also do categories, like if you like to save books, have all your books in one spot, you know, however you decide to organize this is up to you. And it's useful to think about how you want to organize something and where it's going to be kept. So that way you're like, I only have X amount of space in my closet. Here's how I'm going to use my closet. I'm going to organize in these bins by this order. So do some prep work ahead of time and kind of lay out how you want this to work and how this work is going to change a little bit over time. Um, but your archive will evolve with you. Next, you want to store and maintain. So where are you keeping your stuff, both the physical and the digital? And I'm going to get into some best practices about this soon. You also want to make sure that where you keep your archive is safe and accessible over time. I can't tell you how many libraries and museums and archival collections are in basements. For some reason, all of these things just end up in basements, and those are the worst possible spots to put archives. These things need to be safe and accessible. So you need to be able to get to them, but you also need to be able to make sure they're safe from fires, from floods, from pests, from high humidity. And again, I'll talk about some best practices for that in a minute. Next, you want to review. And I suggest doing this annually at a minimum. If you want to do it more than that, that's up to you. But at least once a year, you want to physically check material for damage. The earlier you catch problems, the easier they are to fix. So you, if you have to keep your material in an attic, you want to make sure you're going up there to make sure the roof isn't leaking onto your stuff. If you have digital items, the earlier you check to see if those files are still accessible, the earlier you can transfer them to a new storage service if they happen to be degrading over time. Plus, when you review your material, it gives you a chance to what we call in the library world, the accession, these materials. And basically, that means removing them from your archive. Again, you get to decide when and how to do that. So this is just a great chance to walk through some memories. It's a chance to walk through your life and share it with people. So you can make this a family project if you want. And so now we're going to talk about some best practices. So personal archiving can be as simple or as involved as you want it to be. It can be done cheaply or it can be done at great expense. I want to give you some best practices, and some of these may or may not be applicable to what you want to save. These are some things you're going to want to keep in mind. So first, we're going to look at best practices for physical materials. Now, usually in a home archive, you're going to want to store things in plastic boxes. Libraries don't really like to do that, but when it comes to a home archive where you're kind of at the whims of things, plastic is a pretty good 
way to keep material. If you can afford it, you're also going to want to consider things like archival boxes and packaging materials. These are specially designed to be non-acidic and gentle to the collections within them. And you can find these things at, you know, office supply stores or the container store or things like commercial library and archival vendors. These items will be labeled as either, either archival or non-acidic. And the reason you want to do this is over time, acid can degrade materials. And so you want to prevent that by using non-acidic materials. You also want to consider keeping some really important physical items in a fire box. And this is essentially a fireproof safe. And you can get teeny tiny ones to big, massive ones. My personal one is about this big. Um, it holds its document side. It's basically like a carryable document box. But the reason you want to do this is if there is a fire and you do not have time to save material, this gives these items a chance to survive. You also want to consider some environmental tracking. And what is really important here is that the humidity and temperature stay in the right ranges. And I'll discuss this a little bit more in a minute. And these are very easy to find on Amazon. Mostly you just want to look at temperature and humidity levels because the more humid something is, the more likely it is to grow mold. The drier something is, the more likely it is to start to break down. Shockingly, a lot of our materials and papers, they need to breathe. And so they need a certain level of humidity to do that safely. We also want to look at you know, the location of where we are keeping these materials. So you want to consider accessibility. If this is something you're going to want to look at often or have on hand, you want it near you. If it's something you only need to see during your annual review process, you can keep that off-site. You also want to consider security. How many of these items might be something, you know, personal to you that you don't want to get out there? So does it need to be under lock and key? Does it need to be in your home? Does it need to be in your office? You get to decide that level of security. You also want to consider what are the risks to damage to these materials. As I mentioned earlier, for some reason, you know, collections like these always seem to end up in basements or attics. And those are places that are more susceptible to flooding and mold and pests. And those things can really damage items. Um, you know, you could lose everything. Um, simply because you got a leak, you have a leaky roof. I keep all of my material in a closet where I can see it every day. Um, and another reason I keep it in a closet is dark is best or low light if you can't do that. Sunlight in particular can bleach material over time. If you have a home with a rug, pull back your rug and sometimes underneath you will see that bleaching pattern happen. So this is why you want to keep areas in the dark or in a low light situation. It is simply better for preserving the material over time. And again, getting back to that preservation. This can be difficult to do in a home environment, um, but to the best of your ability, you want to keep the temperature range within 60 to 70 degrees. And the reason I say this is this is comfortable for both objects and people. A lot of times archives, you know, actual professional archives are very cold because the colder something is, the better it is for that material. But this isn't necessarily comfortable for people who need to live in that space. So between 60 and 70 degrees is ideal. Yes, you can waver, but that's kind of the window you're looking at. The same goes for humidity. 40 to 60% is where you want to shoot. This reduces the risk of mold. It reduces the risk of warping. These are some things to keep in mind. And again, you know, this is to keep both humans comfortable and your objects comfortable. Next, you want to keep things dry using something called desiccate. Um, silica gel packs, and I'll have a photo of these later. Um, I save mine from Amazon packages, or every time I order shoes, they come with these little, you know, silica gel packets. Those are some things you can do to keep your material dry. You can also buy professional quality desiccate, but again, you can also do it on the cheap. Next, you want to consider a few other things. How are you going to sort and label these things? You want to know what's in a box without having to open it. You want to know what's in a file without having to open it. So have some, you know, labels on hand. You know, if you're doing a box with physical photos, have separators so you can move the separator without having to go photo by photo to get to what you need. 
You might also want to consider document storage items and or specialty storage items. And you can get document sleeves or folders for those bigger sized things. You can get oversized containers to hold large things. You can get round poster tubes, which are useful um, for storing things that aren't necessarily posters. So whatever you have to store, I can guarantee you there is a storage item out there to keep it safe. You also want to wrap fragile objects, and this should be in non-acidic tissue paper or non-acidic packing paper, again, so the acid doesn't transfer and start to damage your item. Next, we're going to look into a few best practices for digital. Um, and when it comes to doing digital preservation, things get a little complicated, but there are a couple of ways to go about it. So if you are saving something physical, that you then want to make digital. To save that, you can either use an actual scanner or you can use your phone. The cameras on phones these days are fantastic. And there's a little trick where if you're trying to make sure you get it even, there's a little T in most phones that if you get it just right, a yellow and a um, white T will overlap. And that's how you know you're perfectly flat. And that image you're going to take is perfectly flat. You want to consider external storage of this material so it's not just on your, you know, a single computer. So you might want to think about having a hard drive, like an actual physical hard drive or a thumb drive to back this material up on. When you're creating a digital archive, you want to make sure it's just as organized as your physical archive. So you want to have folders. You want to have online file sharing set up. You can do that through Dropbox, through Google, through Microsoft OneDrive, or through Evernote or some other vendor. You also want to back your digital material. Automatic is best, so you don't have to worry about it. If you're not backing something up, the risk of that computer corrupting means you're going to lose everything. Computers die. We all know this. We get the blue screen of death and panic. So you want to back up your material to a cloud service and an external hard drive to make sure that you have lots of copies. So. Speaking of backup, this is where we get to what we in the library world call the Loxies, or lots of copies keep stuff safe. So at least three different locations. I always recommend one physical, and if you can afford it, two digital. And here is where I mentioned digital getting tricky. You want to make sure that those digital copies are backing up to different services. A lot of these backup services use Amazon Web Services. And what happens is you think you're backing it up into two separate locations, but really everything on the back end is going to Amazon Web Services. And Amazon has had failures in the past. There have been libraries who didn't realize they were backing everything up to Amazon, and they have permanently lost some digital collections. So when you go to buy a backup service, make sure you read who is actually storing this material so you can make sure that one isn't just you know, both aren't just necessarily Amazon. So this is why I also recommend having a physical hard drive backup and probably keeping that physical hard drive backup in a firebox. It's just an extra, you know, level of insurance that your digital archive is not going to disappear. And as I mentioned with the physical, you also want to check your files annually. Now, this does not mean every single file. It means going in and spot checking because files do degrade over time or the disks they are on corrupt. So if you go in and you can see this happening, you can transfer your remaining files and not risk losing your entire archive. You also want to update your physical backups every three to five years. Again, physical hardware degrades over time. And luckily, these hard drives get cheaper over time. So as you're backing it up, you're going to get more storage space, faster storage space, and likely more survivable storage space. So again, spot check once a year and physically back, you know, make new copies of your physical backup every three to five years. You also, when you're scanning, want to keep some things in mind for preservation. DPI, or dots per inch, is the resolution at which we save material. Now, 300 DPI is generally considered a preservation standard. You can go much higher than this, but it depends on what you're trying to preserve. The higher the DPI, the bigger the file size and the more storage you need. And unfortunately, storage is not free. So 300 is a good level where you're at a good preservation level for quality, but you're not eating all of your storage. Now, for things like you know family photos that you want to keep forever or you want to reproduce and make reprints of, 600 
100 DPI is what you want to look at. You also want to consider the file format. There are what what there is what excuse me. There are you know two different file formats. There's archival quality and then there's access quality. If or raw are generally considered archival quality. They store things at a much higher level of storage. You know, they don't lose or degrade in quality over time versus something like JPEG, which is still a very good quality, but there's a risk of degrading over time. Luckily, this day and age, JPEG is generally good enough, but for those things you definitely want to keep forever, I highly recommend TIFF. And there are other file formats, and what you're preserving is going to determine your file format. So if you ever have questions about that, feel free to either ask me or the Library of Congress is wonderful about sharing information about this. You also want to consider proprietary file formats, something like PDF which we all use, is actually a vendor-provided software platform. They could go out of business and stop supporting it at any time. Luckily, at this point, PDF is pretty standard, so we will probably always be able to read it, but that's just something to consider, whereas a DOX file is considered open source, and it will be able to be preserved over time. You also want to consider reformatting. And so this can be, you know, when a file is no longer accessible, you want to reformat it into a different version. So, you know, back in the day, I used to keep things on, you know, little mini DV drives. I, I don't have the ability to read that on my computer anymore. I don't even have a CD-ROM drive in my computer anymore. So anything I had on those drives is no longer accessible. So you want to make sure you are updating whatever hardware you have these things on into a platform that you can access. It used to be VCRs were everywhere. Well, now we don't have that. So this is why you always want to make sure your material is being transferred to new file formats so that it can be read by future software. And you also want to think about this when you're sharing material. Some people do not have the ability to read certain files. And I want to point out, I have a lovely little iPhone here. iPhone has now created, or Apple has now created, their own proprietary file format called HEIC for photos. If you're an Apple, you can use it. You can usually see them on computers, you know, if you want to share material that way. But guess what? Some people can't open that file format. So you might want to transition something from like an HEIC file to a JPEG file. And so these are just some things to consider. And when a proprietary file is no longer affordable or may no longer be accessible, it's called obsolescence. So you want to keep that in mind. You just want to make sure you're staying with the times with all of your digital material. To get into the more advanced area, um, we're now looking at metadata, and this is simply data about the data. If you right-click on a photo, you can read information about that file. So what is the file type? You know, what is the size? Is it 28 megabytes or is it 2 megabytes? These things matter. Um, some will even save things like the geographic location, where the photo was taken, when it was downloaded, what you know platform was it made on an iPhone? Was it made on an Nikon camera? Um, this information is generally available and automatically created. But you can also add your own metadata if you want to get into more advanced stuff. And in the future, we will be offering a session on advanced personal archiving where we will cover this. So stay tuned. You also want to think about file naming. When it comes to digital stuff, things can get very messy very quickly. So when it comes to file naming, shorter is better. You should always include a date. I personally prefer to put the dates at the very start of my file names, but you can decide where you want it. You don't want special characters, things like ampersands, dollar signs, percent signs. None of that should be in your file name. When you are creating your file name, you either want to do an underscore or a camel case, where this means basically um, the first letter of every word is capitalized and not use spaces. This leads to less file corruption. It's also easier to read over time. Most importantly, consistency. Whatever file naming practice you decide to go with, be consistent about it. If you name one file one way and another file the other, you're going to just confuse yourself. You also want to be descriptive. So you want to know at first glance what something is about. And if you have multiple files in a folder, you want to use what we call leading zeros, um, where basically you go 001, 002, 
003. And the reason you do this is so that files sort in the order you intend them to be sorted. And it just makes things easier to go through over time. Then you also want to consider creating a file naming index. This explains how the files are named. So if you know you happen to disappear or someone picks up the archive after you, they know what you mean when you name things a certain way. You also want to use this index to show where the files are located. What folder are they in on, on your desktop? What cloud service are they backed up to? You know, what is your backup schedule? So not only do you see the name of the file, you see where it's located. And then for the more advanced work, you want to provide context. This gives you a chance to extend your notes and add memories about the material. Just having photos is great, but if there's no context for it, it can be difficult to know what's going on. So if you want to write a paragraph or two about these people are in this location, here's my memory of that event. It doesn't need to be long, but it needs it's just enough to give some context to that. Then you want some documentation. Create a folder system. Don't throw everything in one folder. Have a series of folders. So you're like, these are my photos. Underneath my photo, here's my vacation to Aruba. Here's my graduation from high school. Have a different folder for every event. And again, you want to consider having a master index. Or you can keep one per folder. You know, in this folder, I've got this information. Again, you get to decide. It's up to you. And then for each document or for each folder, it's useful to provide context and a story, you know, a narrative. Again, this can be as short or as long as you want. Provide dates. Provide a list of people. Give some context. Why was this event happening? It's sort of a chance for you to explain what's going on. So not only do you get a chance to remember what's happening, someone who comes after you now knows what's going on. And then you also, you know, what do you want someone to know who has no material knowledge of this? So if someone brand new, you know, say your grandchild one day wanted to come in and is like, I want to know about grandma. Now they have an idea of what's going on. They get the full experience of what's happening in that material that you've saved. And so what can we do with some of this? Um, there's a lot that you can do. So you can create your own online archive, make it a website, a blog, a newsletter. Maybe you've got a family online chat you can dump all of this into. Um, share with your family and friends or other groups of related people people with related interests. If you like to collect stamps, this is a shout out to my dad who happens to be on here today. You can share those stamps with other people who are interested in stamps. You can also do something like consider joining a resource like Ancestry.com, particularly if you're doing genealogical research. Not only do you get to save that material, you get to share it with others who then may be able to fill in gaps in their own family tree. And so there are a couple final details I want to talk about before I give you a look at my personal archive. So first things first, handwriting. In this photo, this is a picture of a card my father sent me. Unless you are related to him or happen to have ever been his secretary, you probably cannot read this. Many of the things you want to keep could be handwritten. So things like diaries, letters, notes, information on the back of photos, family recipes, anything. So first thing you want to consider, can you read it? If not, try to find someone who can to help you transcribe it. Then think about the future. Instruction in cursive is declining. It's just not being taught in schools anymore. Archivists are now having to teach grad students how to read old school handwriting. So consider typing up anything handwritten and then keeping a copy of that. So not only will you keep the original item, you want to transcribe it and keep a copy of that, either print or digital. You can keep a master file of those transcripts, or you can keep the things together with the original item. Again, however you decide is up to you. Next, when it comes to cookbooks and recipes, I want to make a special call out to those. There is a lot of family and cultural history tied up in the food we eat, we create, and we share. And so here I'm thinking a lot about, you know, oh, grandma's secret cake recipe or grandpa's grilled chicken. You know, you may have physical recipes and cookbooks to save. So in that case, go ahead and digitize and preserve those items. Again, make sure people can read any notes that people have added. Um, 
If you don't have a physical item, consider going to the chef. You know, if your grandma's still around and you want to save her meatball recipe, go talk to her, write down her recipe, or better yet, get a video of her making them. You know, not only then do you have the recipe, you have the memory of that moment. And so it's always helpful to add context to these recipes. You know, how did this happen to become a family favorite. When was it eaten? You know, is this something you always had at the holidays? What are the stories around it? You want to give the recipe some context that just adds some richness to the moment. You also want to consider oral interviews. Everyone has a story to share. We all hang out, we share stories at meals, we just talk. Those are things worth saving. Consider interviewing people to capture certain stories. This can be formal with preset questions or informal where you just chat. In audio, you have the benefit of being able to capture verbal emotions with the actual sound of someone's voice. What you record, um, you know, you can do it using professional equipment or just your phone. Again, the quality here is usually good enough. Um, you also maybe want to consider getting video in addition to the audio, but again, that is up to you. Uh, one example I want to give you is there is a lullaby I sing to my daughter every night. I recorded myself singing that lullaby. Yes, that was mostly for me, but maybe one day she will appreciate it. So if people, you know, send you voice memos or voicemails, you can download those and save them. So consider adding those to your personal archive. There's something about audio that just brings a story alive. Also, Get things off your phone. We all have far too much information on our phones between photos, notes, apps, whatever. There is a lot of great stuff on there. Get it off your phone. You can use an auto backup program like iCloud or Amazon Photos to do an auto backup, or you can manually download these items to a computer. Don't assume that the things on your phone will be safe. Files corrupt over time. You could lose your phone. You might drop it in a lake. You know, take the time to get the good stuff off your phone at least once a month. Just trust me on this. If you try to wait, you know, every two years to do it, it's going to be overwhelming. So once a month, just set aside 30 minutes to an hour, download the things off your phone. And so now we're going to take a dive into my personal archive. This is a work in progress. I'm showing you what is done and what is left to do. I didn't start tackling this until COVID because suddenly we're all at home and I had a great time to go through all of my scrapbooks. So first things first, my process was, this was two years of concerted work so far. I collected everything. Then I went through and weeded it all. There is some stuff in there. For some reason in college, I decided I wanted to save every movie stub of every movie I ever went to. In the moment, it felt good. In retrospect, I didn't care, so those got trash. Other items I digitized, other items I digitized and kept, some I dig digitized and got rid of. And then I scanned or photographed all the material I thought I wanted a digital copy of. Then I organized it by type, as you can see here in these bins, and I stored the keepers. I do a monthly upkeep or so where I add new material to these bins, and then I do a bigger annual review once a year. I have also, I'm sure my daughter will thank me for this one day, started my daughter's personal archive. And once I hand this over to her, she will decide what she wants to keep or not. But this is just to get things started. So I don't just hand her a big pile of stuff and say, have fun with it. So next we see here, this is an archival quality photo box. And this is back when we all used to take print photos. And what I have done here is I've organized things by year and then within that year to the best of my ability, chronologically by month. And as you can see, I have the dividers here. So I know what year. And you'll see in the back, I've also tucked in a few other odds and ends some Christmas cards, and on the side, I have some physical CD-ROMs of digitized projects I did in college. These I still need to get converted because I have no ability to read these on my computer now. So next up is my box of memorabilia. On the left, we have a, you see that wooden bin with the intertwined rings? That is the card box from my husband and I's wedding. My uncle made that for us. That is something I wanna keep. Within that, as you'll see in the photo on the right, I have stored some other stuff. I have my graduation cords. I have the hand fasting ribbons from our wedding. My husband's piggy bank from when he was a kid in there. The cupcake topper we had at our wedding is in there. Um, 
Going back to the other image, you will also see there's a cross stitch my mother made for me when I was a baby. You know, there's some publications I've been in, some diaries, all of these things I want to keep in my personal archive. And ideally, I would love to keep these in a better system than this, but I only have so much space in my closet. So this is the system that works for me. Again, to make your archive work, you have to make it work for you. Next, these are the silica desiccate gel packets I was telling you about. Anytime I get a package with these, I save them and I toss them in these bins. You want to rotate these out. So if you know one's been in there for a while, throw it away and put a new one in. This is a way you can do these things on the cheap. You know, these arrive at our door all the time. You might as well save them and put them to use as opposed to throwing them away. Next, we have a look at my daughter's archive, and you'll see up in the corner more of those desk gel packets. On the left, these are books that we read together um, when she was a little baby that she adored, and I wanted to keep those. In the bottom, you will see another small bin. This is from my parents. They saved my Girl Scout badges, and I decided I wanted to keep that. They saved my very first public library card. I wanted to save that. On the right-hand side in the upper part, you'll see a rattle my uncle made, you know, a music box from when my husband was a kid, my daughter's going home outfit her very first Capitals jersey. These are all things I wanted to keep for my daughter or myself. And down below, the most extensive part of her archive is her art. And I want to share a story about this. When she was born, I said, I'm going to save all of her artwork. Not the physical items, but I'm going to digitize everything. Oh, yes. I thought I was going to digitize everything. Well, let me tell you, when they're one, they don't make a ton of art. Now that she's nearly four, she makes more art than I can possibly keep up with. So once a month, my husband and I sit down with all of her new art creations and we decide, what are we going to trash? What are we going to digitize and then trash? What are we going to digitize and then keep? And at this point, the keepers are maybe 5% of what she makes. More than 50% of it ends up in the trash. There's only so many doodles we can save. But the material we are saving have meaning to us. And maybe one day she will be happy that we saved these items. Next, here's a look at sort of the back end work. And this is still messy because I'm still working on it. You will see I have made files um, with things in them. And then on the right, you will see a look at, you know, I have my dated pictures. Within my 2023 20, year, I have specific files for certain days. Again, what this is going to look like is going to change depending on what you want and what you need. Other things to look at here, like on the left, I used to do these high school productions. I wanted to keep the posters, but I didn't need to keep the physical items, so I took photos of them. In the middle, you see the scans from my bullet journal. On the right, when I was in high school, I did all of these things and we got pins. I didn't need to keep the physical pins, so I just scanned them. So in addition to things, you know, you know, photos and documents. You can keep things like posters and flyers and high school projects. You can keep ribbons. You can keep pins. You can keep medals. You know, I decided not to keep any of these physical items, but I wanted the memory of them, so I kept them digitized. And then we get to sharing the archive. Um, what we have done, I use an auto backup service from Amazon for all of our photos. And what we have done is created a shared album for, you know, the grandparents. And we dump select photos in that. And then because everyone in my family has an Amazon Alexa, that those photos get shared out and we update this monthly so new photos are being added. So this way we get to see photos of our family and my family gets to see photos of our family. So what's left? I still do my monthly upkeep. I still do my annual review, but because I'm still working on these things, I have a bunch of file renaming to do. I'm finally standardizing things. Before I used to just randomly name things, and now I'm going through the hard process of renaming all of these things so they're easier to find. I also want to create a master index. So this will be by folder with file names, where I will then provide a narrative story of what's going on, the people in the photos, maybe where the location of this event happened and the context. And then for the bigger events, I want to write down some narrative documentation. And the earlier you do this, the easier it is. And you don't have to do this alone. There are some wonderful resources out there here in D.C., DCPL, the DC Public Library, provides a wonderful memory lab. In this lab, they have scanners, you know, not just document scanners, but big oversized scanners. They have ways you can convert old media to new formats. And so you can make an appointment to learn how to use this media, uh, memory lab, and then you can go in and make time to use the space to save your memories. 
Here in DC, we also have the Library of Congress. They have their own um, personal archiving website. And I will send out anyone who is registered for today, I will send you the links to all of these in a follow-up email. So the Library of Congress is a great place to go for some of those weirder questions you might have. Another thing I want to point out is the dew point calculator. And this is sort of getting into the nitty gritty. But essentially, you can put in what is the temperature, what is the humidity, and it will tell you how at risk that specific space is for mold or other forms of degradation. So this is a way to keep your material safe. And then three books I think are worth picking up are The Complete Guide to Personal Digital Archiving, Managing the Digital you and personal archiving preserving our digital heritage. Most of these focus on the digital materials simply because we are so at risk of losing our history simply because people think it's online, it's fine. That's not the case. It's online, it's only sometimes safe. You can lose that material overnight. So it's worth knowing how to manage these things. You know, people used to write letters and we kept those letters. People are not doing the same thing for email. One thing I have done is I opened up an email address for my daughter. Once a month or so, I sent her an email. Well, female could decide to close one day. So what I am also doing is downloading those emails as a PDF and saving those in my personal archive. So these are things you want to consider. Just because it's online doesn't mean it's safe. And so now I want to give plenty of time for Q&A. Thank you again for attending today. We'll have time for both... Um, questions recorded and unrecorded, feel free to drop your question in the chat. And again, I will post this recording to YouTube, and I will also send out the link to all of the resources, as well as the link to the recording to anyone who registered today. So let's get with the Q&A. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Right, not seeing anything up. So do we have any recommendations for AWS alternatives? Not off the top of my head, but usually Apple and Amazon don't play nice together. So that's a good way to go. Um, simply look at who Amazon is competing with and generally they're safe. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, usually you can find things through um, Dropbox is another good one. Um, but basically, if you have one Apple and one Amazon, you're good. Um, and, you know, there are a couple of platforms, um, but those are the big ones. Dropbox, Amazon Photos, and Apple. Um, Microsoft OneNote is another good one. Or, um, Microsoft OneDrive is another good place to keep material. What's like the digital storage cost per month? Well, that's going to depend on how much material you have to save and where you want to save it. So for my physical uh, or for my digital photos, I use um, Amazon to auto back up my phone and to auto back up the photos and videos I have on my computer. Photos on Amazon, as long as you have a Prime account, which I believe you can get a student, I don't know that, I think it's $129 a year for that. But then I pay um, $199 a month for that auto backup. And that's unlimited photos and I believe 500 gigabytes of video. The more storage you have, the more expensive it gets. Um, most of these services, if you want to store things in like Google Photos, that's free up to a point. So if you really want to spread your things around so you're not paying a ton of money, just go up to the free limit in various areas like do Google Photos, do Apple Photos, do Amazon up to the free point. Um, and then that way you're also spreading your archive around. But again, it depends on how much you want to store. The more stuff you have, the more expensive it gets. Right. Seeing if any more questions are going to come in. All right, just in case anyone wants to ask a question that is not recorded, I am going to end this recording. And again, thank you for attending today.